I was glad when they said unto me, Let us go into the house of the Lord. Our feet shall stand within thy gates, O Jerusalem. Jerusalem is built as a city that is compacted together. Whether the tribes go up, the tribes of the Lord, unto the testimony of Israel, to give thanks unto the name of the Lord. Good morning, Four Clark. Hi, this is Pastor Stacy, coming to you again on our YouTube station. Just excited about that little excerpt from Psalm 122, letting us know that we can give thanks to God in all that we do. Giving him thanks for last night lying down, giving him thanks for providing food on our tables, and giving him thanks for our families being safe in the time of this pandemic. Just giving honor to God. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Now today, to me, this is a grand opportunity. An opportunity to speak to those who know the Lord, to those who don't know the Lord, and to those who might be struggling in their faith walk. It's an honor and a privilege at, in this time to break the bread of life. The world as we know it is in disarray. And if there's any time that we needed a savior, and not just any savior, a risen savior, it is right now. Now, as we know, the Bible speaks of wars and rumors of wars, famines and pestilence and trouble throughout the land. But through it all, Oh, I'm glad to say that through it all, God still sits high and he looks low. A God that takes care of us in the time of our need. A God that monitors our mindset and a, a God that maketh us lie in green pasture. A God that restores our very soul. A God that leads us beside still waters. A God that is my all, my all, and my all. Just talking about God. God in all of his wisdom blessed us today with a complete and a holy document. It's called the Bible and it has the Old and the New Testament. And for the sake of today's sermon, we're actually going to look into scriptures that come from both the Old and both the New Testament. Both are full of power and both are full of prestige. Both are full of might and both are full of victory. So at this time today, let us look to these pieces of scripture. The first is going to be found in the Old Testament, and it's going to be found in the original book, Genesis, beginning in Genesis 19. So if you have your Bibles or your devices, I'd like for you to turn with me to Genesis 19. And we're going to begin reading at that first verse of Genesis 19. Amen. And there came two angels to Sodom at Eve, and Lot sat in the gate of Sodom, and Lot seeing them rose up to meet them, and he bowed himself before him to the ground. And he said, Behold now, my lords, turn in, I pray you, unto the servant's house, and tarry all night, and wash your feet, and ye shall rise up early and go your way. And they said, Nay, but we will abide in the street all night. And he pressed upon them greatly, and turned, and they turned to him, and entered into his house, and he made them a feast. And he did bake unleavened bread, and they did eat. But before they lay down, the men of the city, even the men of Sodom, encompassed the house, both young and old, all people from every quarter. And they called unto Lot, and said unto him, Where are the men which came to you this night? Bring them out unto us, that we may know them. And Lot went out to the door, and unto them shut the door after him, and said, I pray unto you, brethren, do not so wicked. Now, as we go down into this text, I want you just to look personally at the scripture that says, uh, verses 22 through 26. And it said, Haste thee, escape there, for I cannot do anything that you come hither. Therefore the name of the city was called Zor. And the sun was rising upon the earth when Lot entered unto Zor. And then the Lord rained down upon Sodom and Gomorrah brimstone and fire from out of the Lord of heaven. And he overthrew these cities and all the plain and all the inhabitants of the cities, which grew upon the ground. But his wife looked back from behind him, and she became a pillar of salt. His wife looked back from behind him, looking at that destruction, and she became a pillar of salt. 
Now, our next text is going to be found in the New Testament, and we're going to look at 2 Timothy, and we're going to read verses 4 through 7. And we're going to look at 2 Timothy. And we're going to read, starting at verse 1, first chapter, and it said, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, the will of God, according to the promise of life, which is Jesus Christ. And 4, it says, Greatly desire to see thee, being mindful of thy years, that I may be filled with joy. When I call to remembrance the unfettered faith that is in thee, which dwelt first in your grandmother Lois, in thy mother Eunice, and I am persuaded, persuaded that it is you in you also. Therefore I put thee in remembrance, that you stir up the gift of God which is in thee by putting on the laying of hands. And it goes into that great text where it says, For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but a spirit of power, a spirit of love, and a spirit of a sound mind. Now, church, when we look at both of these particular pieces of scripture, we're most likely wondering how are these pieces of scripture related? We look at a story of Lot and him leaving Sodom and Gomorrah, his wife turning into a pillar of salt, which is in the Old Testament. And then we have Paul writing to Timothy, encouraging him, and also putting into remembrance things that he saw in that young man. Now, there is a connection between these two randomly put pieces of scripture. As we investigate the connection, let us look first at the 19th chapter of Genesis. We see Lot entertaining angels. And I know that my great theologians could tell me that Lot was the nephew of Abraham who took his family to a foreign land and started to dwell there. The land grew wicked. And God was extremely angry with its inhabitants. All types of wickedness were taking place in these cities and God was planning to utterly destroy them. As the text opened up, the two emissary angels of God, they go to the house of Lot and as they eat and break bread with Lot and his family, the men of the town from every section, from every quarter, surround the house. The men are vocal and they demand that Lot offer up the men of the house to them, the Bible says, so that they could get to know them. Now, Lot understood what that meant. He actually offered up his virgin daughters to them because he didn't want these men to be tampered with or to be messed with. But they did not want the women. They wanted the men, and they became even more forceful and more angry and more demanding. They tried to break into Lot's house to get at the emissary angels. So as they tried to break in, the angels blind the men and then they look to Lot and they tell Lot to get his family out of this wicked city so that the Lord could be merciful to him and his upbringing and, and his offspring. Now, it seems that Lot, when he heard this, actually had a little bit of hesitation. He should have automatically said, yes, I'm ready to go. But the angels had to encourage him and tell him, leave this wicked city. Now, it's hard to leave a life that you knew. It's hard to leave a life in which you had things, in which you had set up, in which your family had started to thrive, even if that life was not even edifying or pleasing to God. But I tell you one thing, church. That if an angel emissary of the Lord comes to you and tells you to leave and go to a place, you need to run, you need to jump, you need to swim, you need to fly, you need to walk, you need to crawl, whatever it takes, you need to get out of the situation. So when Lot and his family are a safe distance away, the Lord rains down fire and brimstone on the two cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. Now, as God is performing these mighty acts, Lot's wife looks back and immediately she's turned into a pillar of salt. Now, all that God had done for Lot's family, all that God had done for him in that wicked city, Lot's wife still was holding on to her old life. She couldn't leave that old life alone and she had to turn back. Now, she most likely missed the pleasures that were provided in those wicked cities. 
forgetting about what a pleasure it is to worship the master. She most likely missed the friends that she had in Sodom and Gomorrah, forgetting all along the friend that she had in Christ Jesus. She most likely missed walking the streets of that evil town, forgetting that if she stayed on the team with King Jesus, that one day, one day she would walk streets of gold. Oh yes, she forgot about her relationship with the master and instead yearned for a life in a sinful place. She thought that she was missing out. So as they're escaping, as they're leaving that city, she had to have one more look. She had to have one more glance of that wicked city. So she looked back and turned into a pillar of salt. Now, there may be some of you out there who are caught in the mindset that you are going to come to the Lord when you are good and ready. When you've done everything that you've wanted to do, that's when you want to come to God. When you fully experienced what the world has, then and only then will you be ready to serve him. I humbly ask you to change your mindset and start now to form a bond and a relationship with him. Because you don't want to be like Lot's wife, who stayed in a carnal mindset that caused her to miss out on a life of immortality with the master. Now, Next, if we look to the New Testament scripture, we see the great theologian of the Gentiles, Paul. Now, he writes in this particular epistle of this letter to Timothy. He talks to Timothy and encourages him, but he also, as we find, is at the end of his life. And he's looking back over his life as he's in prison for the last time. He writes Timothy, his young son in the ministry. He encouraged him to, him to preach the word in and out of season. He informs him to keep a level head, to be stationary in his faith. But as he looks at Timothy, he also looks at himself. Not in disgust, but in pride of how God had brought him a mighty long way. Churches, we remember the life of Paul. We remember that he was a persecutor of the Jews. But as God came to him and knocked him on the ground on that great day in Damascus, he turned and became an emissary to the Gentiles, telling them about the goodness of God and witnessing to many. This is proven when he explains later on in the text, not what was read, but just later on in the text that he had fought the good fight, that he finished his course, but through it all, he kept the faith. I tell you, church, off of that alone, every blood-washed believer should be ready to run around the place in which they're watching this video to talk about the Lord and to experience his goodness. Wow, church, loving God. Now, church, if you place both of these scriptures side by side, you might say they are still not recognizable as being succinct or being together. But I tell you, in both pieces of scripture, you will see two people who are at different stages in their faith. You have a woman who knew God, but still wanted to live a life in which she was in control instead of letting God lead, guide, and direct her. Then we have a saint that is at the end of his life, reveling in the fact that he didn't turn away from Christ, and that he's able to look back on a life without regret, a life without shame, and a life that was full of dignity. Church, the saint was able to look back, but the sinner could only turn back. So to leave you with a thought for today's message, look back, but don't turn back. Look back, but don't turn back. Now, church, I believe that there's a time in everyone's life where we have a realization that we need to change. You might not be a quote-unquote bad person, but I believe there's a yearning in the life of the mortal who is finite, who wants to be in contact with the infinite who is God. 
Some people call it an epiphany. Others write it as an aha moment. And we've all had these aha moments. You know, the time where you realize that a tomato was a fruit that is actually considered a vegetable. That basic arithmetic can help you balance your checking and your savings accounts. And the real reason why Southerners like sweet tea. I know you know the answer because it's good. Oh yes, we've all had those epiphany and aha moments. But to the Christian, an aha moment is different. Whatever term you may use, there is a longing in us to be better people. I like, it call, I like calling it the moment I knew I needed to be saved. See, once you come into this realization, you seek out godly people. You start attending church. And then you process in your understanding of Jesus more and more by becoming a grounded, rooted believer. I believe that you finally feel right. And then my question to you is when you get these feelings of feeling right, do you stay right? The allure of the world is tempting. The world teaches us that good is bad and bad is good. It tells us that we can live every kind of way because we're grown. These ideas don't happen overnight. But once they get ingrained in your day to day, it's hard to let them go. I believe that's what happened to Lot's wife. She knew God. She had started fulfilling the longing for the master. But the allure of Sodom and Gomorrah was just too much for her. Even in his destruction, or even in its destruction, in the destruction of both cities, she still had a longing to turn back to see what she was missing. She couldn't be satisfied in the fact that God was saving her and her family from utter ruin. She couldn't be satisfied that she was leaving a place of destruction and going into a place of life. She couldn't be happy with what God was doing for her and her family. She just had to have one more look, one more view of that worldly and lawless system. And the reward for her incessant worldly attachment was that she looked back and became instantly a pillar of salt. Now, to some, this punishment seems over the top. But I beg to differ. You see, if you are 100% attached to the Lord, and you put something above him, then you are negating that Christian contract. Because it states that you should have no other God before me. See, the world is alluring. But remember, church, that he was wounded for our transgressions, that he was bruised for our iniquities, that the chastisement of our peace was upon him. So if he did that for me, why can't I stick with him? If he sacrificed his life for me, why can't I sacrifice more of myself for him? Instead, we find the world pulled her and she became salt. If God did anything for you, and if he set you on a pathway of righteousness, we have to turn from our wicked ways and acknowledge the father of all truth. We can no longer lean to our own understanding. We have to look to the father of wisdom. Instead of walking by sight, we will now move by faith. Instead of seeking gurus or soothsayers, we go directly to the risen Savior. It will be complete in our faith if we keep our hands in the hand of Jesus. He'll never let you falter. He'll never let you fail. He'll never let you waver. He will always be there for you, looking out for your best interest. This church will keep you from turning back. Now, Paul, as we see in the text of 2 Timothy, approached this problem just a little bit differently. From the text, we see that he writes to Timothy, but he is at the end of his Christian journey. 
He was reveling in his new life in Christ as he was encouraging a young minister. Paul had the strength of character. He had the strength in faith that allowed him to review his life and he reviewed his life through the lens of Jesus. He was able to hold on to that little bit of Holy Ghost which allowed him to look back over his life and not to turn back into foolishness. He was able to see his mistakes that were made to goals in ministry and he was able to attain and reach those goals because of the law. He was able to do this because he had a relationship with the master like no other. See, church, Paul moved with the spirit. He acted in the spirit. He rejoiced in the spirit. He lived in the spirit. And he realized something that some of us Christians showed us forget along the way. That we have to always keep God first and move when God tells us to move. See, I think the modern day Psalms is told us best that becoming a Christian is not a start, it's not a finish, it's a lifestyle. And most importantly, becoming a Christian takes a lot of work. See, Paul understood that time must be spent in the Word, that we have to have a laser point focus on Jesus, that life is not what you make it, but it's what God has gifted. Oh, let me say it again. It's not what we make it, but it's what God has gifted. That we are not our own, but that we belong to a heavenly father, a king like none other. Paul knew it, he lived it, and he was able to look over his life and not turn back into the old ways and into that foolishness. But many of us look at Paul and we say he was an old man. We say he only had a few days left, that he was in a depressed state. But I tell you that he was a prisoner that had hope of freedom. You see, even though he was bound by the constraints of this earthly world, he was free in Christ Jesus. See, he could have turned back during this time, doubting the power of God. He could have turned to false teaching and tried to free himself by renouncing God and trying to impress his jailers. But I come to tell you again that Paul was already free. Even though he was in jail, his soul was free and allowed him to express himself in a way that we could only dream of. So how do we reach this level of faith? How do we live a life like Paul's? It's easy, church. You just have to start by making your request known. You have to seek God for yourself and ask him specifically for what you need. If you desire his presence, ask it of the Lord. If you need a little more wisdom, ask it of Christ Jesus. If you just need him to teach you something, you go to his feet and sincerely, humbly by yourself and ask of him to do it for you. You ask him to transform you to get rid of that reprobate mind, to transform thinking, to transform acting, and to transform you so that you can be a better person in the world, in your families, and in this community. You have to realize that God paid a price to buy you out of a world of sin, and that you need him in every aspect of your life. Whatever you're doing, wherever you're going, at any time, you can call on King Jesus. So church, if you need him, cry out to him. Give him the praise. Tell him that he's worthy. He's more than worthy because he is truth. He is a way maker. He is a burden bearer. He's a lily of the valley. He's a bright and morning star. He's my rock. He's my, fear. He's my shield. He's my strong foundation. And he's my will in the middle of a wheel. He is God. He is Lord. He is King. And he is Master. He can provide you with all of the rest that you need. Paul knew it and understood it. Lot's wife, unfortunately, did not. So if you follow the example of Paul, 
You can look back over your life, but you won't turn back into the old man of that life. Now, church from the red text, we see two individuals, one that's turned away from God and the other one who has grown stronger and stronger in the Lord. Both are in the midst of reflection. One is reflecting on the life that she feels that she's lost instead of the life she's about to gain. The other is focused on a life that was great and a life that was even going to be greater than he knew it was going to be. We must too reflect on our lives and the mistakes and missteps that we made. We too must reflect where God has brought us from and where God is going to take us. But just remember, as you reflect, church, just remember as you're thinking about those times, just remember as you're thinking over the goodness of God to look back, but not to turn back. To look back, but not to turn back. May God bless you and may God keep you. Church, I'm not going to lie to you. This is a good day. Not because it's Sunday, but it's a day that we can again be together, breaking the bread of life and talking about our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I'm excited for you that you enjoy the message and allow it to really resonate in the lives of you and your family. And I pray right now that as we go to God, that we ask him to open up our minds and to constantly give us protection. Let us go to the master. Father God, we come to you this morning just giving you thanks, honor, and praise for another day of life, health, and strength. Another day that you saw fit to bless and another day that you saw fit to take care of your people. I pray, O oh God, that everyone under the sound of my voice recognizes your deity and just ask to be with you more and more. I pray, God, that you keep them safe, that you hold them, God, that even in the midst of this pandemic, you still show them that you are God and that you are still in the blessing business. For this is our prayer. And in Christ Jesus' name we pray it. Amen. Four o'clock, I hope that your family is well. I hope that you still continue to follow the guidelines, rules, and regulations of keeping yourself safe from this viral epidemic. But most importantly, I want to see that you stay prayed up. Stay in your word. Make sure that you keep Jesus first, because he will always never leave you nor forsake you. Be blessed.